the fish, don't read it negatively, the fish is a rescue operation. The fish rescues Jonah from drowning. So in the midst of his crisis, God does what God typically does in the Bible, is he sends rescue operations. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. The book of Jonah is one of the shortest books in the Bible, yet it's packed with profound truths about hearing and obeying the voice of God. We'll be discussing that book today with Bishop Barron, who joins us from our studio in Rochester, Minnesota. Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Good to see you. Lots of exciting things in your life recently. Uh, one of them is the upcoming Catholic Schools Week, which I know oh, you yeah. really enjoy. Tell us I do. What, what that's like as a as a bishop. How do you celebrate Catholic Schools Week? I go all over the diocese, and I've got a big sprawling diocese that goes from Wisconsin to South Dakota, all across southern Minnesota. And um, I go to these very schools all over the place. So next week is basically, it's like one big event every day, but it involves a lot of driving. I'll drive maybe hour, hour and a half, and then there's a big mass with the kids, usually followed by a lunch of some kind. And But I always get a kick out of it. Um, last year was my first year here, and I did, I think, four schools. Say, maybe it's four or five this year, but every day next week, I'll be just in my car going out to one of these places. But try to get our Catholic school kids uh, fired up and to focus them on the Lord. I can't think of anything more important. So I, I did a lot of office work last week. I had a lot of meetings and all that, which are also very important. But as, as um, a bishop, I can't think of anything more important than reaching out to the you know Catholic school kids in our diocese. Another cool thing you recently did was another appearance on our friend Jordan Peterson's mm. podcast. You guys had a long two-hour yeah. rangy conversation. I, I'm not sure if that will have aired by the time this episode does. If not, we'll post it when it does. But tell us how that conversation went. Oh, as always, it's a joy to talk to him. And we talked mostly about the Bible and uh, the spiritual life, a little bit of philosophy. Um, it's always a joy to be with him. He reminds me in a way here of Cardinal George. I used to say when I had dinner with Cardinal George, it was like my my doctoral defense. You know, when you're talking to Jordan, you're operating at a pretty high level uh, intellectually, and he keeps you on your toes. I mean, he's got such a lively mind, has thought about things so deeply, and um, has such a rich command of the intellectual tradition. So it's a joy. I, I always uh, get a kick out of talking to him. I'm not sure when it's coming out. Uh, I don't think we ever determined that, but probably sometime soon. I just marvel at his stamina, even beyond yeah. his intellectual acumen. Yeah. He's got this upcoming tour. There's something like 40 or 50 events, and it's like two, three-hour lectures at every one. You told me for your conversation here, after two hours, you were you, you know, pretty tired, but he he's just ramping up, ready to go for another couple hours. Incredible energy. Yeah, incredible energy. <laughs> well, uh, I'd encourage listeners to also stick around to the end of this episode. We have a special announcement about the future of the Word on Fire show, but we're going to save that for the end of the episode. For now, I want to turn to the book of Jonah. This is one of the most mysterious and interesting books of the Old Testament. Uh, it's very short. It's only about a thousand words. Most Bibles print it in about two or three pages. So you can read it in one sitting, but it's loaded with profound lessons. Uh, Bishop, first of all, help us understand the background. What's what's the genre of the book of Jonah? What type of book is it? Well, it's a prophetic book, so it's in the, it's, Jonah is considered one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. What's interesting about the book of Jonah, so many things, but one is, unlike, let's say, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and, and Zechariah, and Hosea, it's not so much the sayings of the prophet that matter. In fact, Jonah says very, very little in the story. It's about him. Um, it's about the prophet himself and his relationship to God. And um, so it's a prophetic book, but of a particular nature. It's, the, it, it's how we live out our spiritual lives and how we respond to our own prophetic call. And mind you, Every baptized person's a prophet. So uh, whenever you mention the prophets, we should pay close attention because that's our identity. And so we're meant to see in Jonah, all right, what we're called to be and to do. 
I thought we could just walk through the book and, and get yeah. your insights on it. I know as a bishop, you've told me before, this is this is one of the central roles that you see bishops as having, unpacking the word, uh, helping interpret it for God's people. So the story of Jonah begins with the Lord speaking to Jonah. The Lord says to him, set out for the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, for their wickedness has come to me. However, instead of going to Nineveh, as the Lord commanded, Jonah flees. Yeah. He finds a ship going to Tarshish. He pays the fare and goes down into it, as the scripture says, away from the Lord. Uh, how should we read these opening events? Look how it begins. Uh, it's typical of the Bible. The Bible never uh, valorizes um, our projects. I'm going to set out and do something. Here is my plan. And think of, you know, the Greek philosophers and so many great heroic figures. It's, you know, my will and look at our culture. Look at our culture. It's all me, me, mine, my voice and my plan and my Bible has no time for that. It begins with a call that comes from outside Jonah and, and without preparation. <laughs> it's not like, well, now, Jonah, I I'm going to be asking you eventually to do something. And so let me, you know, give you a chance to respond. None of that. It's God speaks. And that's the way the Bible operates. Uh, I'm not in command here. My life is not about me. It's not about my projects. It's about what God wants to accomplish through me. Now, that's not oppressive or abusive. On the contrary, the more I respond to what God wants me to be and to do, the happier and more alive I'm going to be. But we should attend to the very beginning of that. That's how the voice of God comes. Um, and we have to obey it. And then, you know, as you say, the, the great truth is, all right, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh, capital city of Israel's bitter enemy, Assyria. Uh, so, so, Jonah, get up and go a long way from home. Uh, go into the capital giant city of the enemy people. Uh, don't go with anyone, as far as we can tell. There's no one with them. Just go by yourself into this enemy city and begin proclaiming repentance. Um, attractive proposal? Hardly. It's an extremely difficult proposal. Well, that's life in the NFL, right? <laughs> that's what the spiritual life is often like, is God is calling us to do something. Our conscience is summoning us to do something that's difficult. And now everyone listening, you know what I'm talking about. There are certain moments in your life when you hear the voice of God. And, and I, I use conscious there on purpose because I'm with John Henry Newman, that that for most of us is the most vivid experience of God's voice, is the voice of the conscience. When it says, here's what you need to do. Now, is that typically easy no. Why? Because because we're sinners and we live in a sinful world. And so what the conscience is telling us is often very, very challenging. That's why I, I've always liked Merton's line, you know, if you're facing several uh, options, find the one that's hardest. That's what God wants you to do, most likely, <laughs> you know. So get up, Jonah, go to the, on this very difficult assignment. Of course he goes the other way. It's what most of us do, to be honest. Most of us sinners, when we feel and hear the voice of conscience, we say, no, I, I'm going to take the path of least resistance. I'm going to try to escape from the summons of God. But see, stay with conscience, Brandon, for a second, because I think it's illuminating here. <laughs> What's the one thing you can't escape from? Is the voice of your conscience, because it's in you. It's buried deep inside of you. I can run away from your voice. You know, I can run away from what you're asking me to do, but I can't run away from the voice of God, which is echoing within my own heart. So he makes the mistake that we sinners all make. We think we can avoid the press of God. The point about uh, the ship and Tarshish, I think, is Nineveh is east by land from where Jonah is. That's where God wants him to go. Instead, he goes west by sea. <laughs> and he goes as far west by sea as you can. Tarshish meant Timbuktu. It meant, I'm going to go to the ends of the world. That's how far we sinners try to run away from the press of God. That last part about 
uh, Jonah heading away from the Lord in the opposite direction calls to mind Luke's gospel and the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Yeah. After Jesus' death, these disciples give up. They're crestfallen. They begin walking away from Jerusalem, but then they encounter the Lord. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread, and the Lord turns them around and has them moving back toward Jerusalem in the correct direction. What are the biblical authors, both of Jonah and Luke, trying to teach us here? Follow the Lord, not yourself. Follow the call of conscience, not your own projects and plans. And and when we try to run away from God, it's kind of hopeless. It's not going to work. Think of, you know, Paul Tillich read Psalm uh, 139 this way, which I thought was very interesting, is, you know, I climb to the heavens, you're there. I go to the sea's furthest end. Even there, your right hand holds me up. Behind and before you besiege me, your hand ever laid upon me. You know, Lord, you search me, you know me. He read it as like the sinner's lament. <laughs> I'm trying to get away from you. I go to the heavens, but you're there. I go to the depth of the earth, and even there you are. I go to the sea's furthest end. Even there your right hand holds me up. Behind and before you besiege me. It's the sinner lamenting that he can't escape from God. And the whole point is, well, stop trying. Surrender to God because it will make you more fully alive. It's our sinful um, soul that dictates otherwise. So those two stories, Emmaus and Jonah, are making a similar point there. So Jonah turns away from God, heads in the wrong direction, and then we read God's response. It says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and the storm was so great that the ship Jonah was on was about to break up. Jonah goes down into the hold of the ship to sleep, and as he rests, the crew of the ship cast lots to discover on whose account this evil has fallen upon, and the lot falls on Jonah. He's responsible. And the men learn that Jonah was fleeing from the Lord, and they say to him, how could you do such a thing? How do we read this turn of events? What do the storms signify here? Well, remember in the Bible, I've said this often, uh, the tohu vabohu, the primal chaos at the beginning of, of creation, reasserts itself throughout the Bible. Think of the flood of Noah. Think of the Red Sea that has to be parted. Uh, think of Jesus walking on the tohu vabohu. Well, here's another instance of it. Is the primal chaos reemerges how? When we resist the call of God. So that the Lord sent the storm, it's very important. How do we read when bad things happen to us? You say, oh, it's just dumb suffering. It's just this dumb thing that happened. No, I'm with John Paul II. I mean, people of faith, there are no coincidences. I mean, everything, Jean-Pierre de Cossa said the same thing. Everything that is, is either uh, directly or indirectly uh, God's will. And so God sends the storm. It's a kind of spiritual physics, isn't it? When you resist God, storms will uh, rise up within you and without you. Uh, it will affect you adversely and lots of other people adversely. You know, I used to say this when I was at the seminary, uh, and these guys are discerning their vocation. I would say, and partially with Jonah in mind, you know, you're discerning for yourself, that's true. Like, what does the Lord want me to do? But your decision will have an Im enormous impact all around you. And if you discern poorly, you resist what God wants you to do, that's bad for you, and it's bad for all kinds of people around you, right? Because we're all interconnected. So these innocent people aboard the ship, they, they didn't know who Jonah was, but they're in danger too because he's resisting the, the call of God. That's worth thinking about. I think all of us sinners should think about that, is my sin is never just my problem. In a way, it's it's problem for everyone around me. And on the contrary, my my goodness, my virtue, when I do follow God's will and I start radiating goodness around me, it, it's beneficial to others. I think there, yeah, I mentioned Dante at the last um the last broadcast, uh, Brandon, because Dante has Satan buried in the ice and he has these two great wings, right? And the wings are beating because he's trying to fly, but he's stuck. But all that does is it, it blows this awful cold air all around hell. That's a great image. See, when a sinner is stuck in his own will, and he's meant to fly, that's why he has wings, right? But all he, all he succeeds in doing is making the world around him colder. He, he's affecting other people adversely. 
That's Jonah aboard the ship. What's it like when you resist the voice of your conscience? You don't do what your conscience tells you. Um, Expect trouble. Well, we get the trouble coming up next because the men, as a result of Jonah being responsible for these storms, throw him overboard. They hurl him into the sea. And a whale, although many biblical translations say a great fish, fish, swallows Jonah and he's inside the whale's belly for three days and three nights. What does this whole thing mean? What does the whale represent? First of all, I think it's the ubiquity of God. So Jonah thinks I can I can escape from God. Well, of course you can't. God commands the waves and commands the animals and the, the fish in the sea and all that. So it, it's the impossibility of escaping from God. But also the fish, don't read it negatively, the fish is a rescue operation. The fish rescues Jonah from drowning. So in the midst of his crisis, God does what God typically does in the Bible, is he sends rescue operations. Think of the fish here as a bit like Noah's Ark. So there's the Tohu Vabohu comes back, right? The flood of Noah, and God has Noah build an ark. So he sends the great fish to rescue Jonah. But see, what else is going on there? Think of, you know, it's it's impossible, literally, but think of it now figuratively. Jonah inside of this fish can't move. He has no control over his life. He's utterly at the at the beck and call of forces beyond him. It's the it's the um, surrounding of the rebellious ego. It's God sends this constricting reality so that Jonah can't go where he wants to go. He can't resist. Now, as he was experiencing that, it's hell. It's hell. And I've I've dealt with lots of people in the course of my ministry who are in a similar situation. They find themselves in hell, that they're they're constricted, they're hemmed in, they're they're out of control. How do you read that? Again, just dumb suffering, or do you read it as perhaps God's way of limiting your own will and ego, that he might bring you where he wants you to go? Where does the fish bring him? To shore where he vomits him out, and that's where God wants Jonah to be. So how do you read your own depression, your own anxiety, your own psychological crisis? Could it be a way of God leading you where you don't want to go, but where he wants you to go? I want to stick with the whale for just another moment. Uh, If you follow or interact with any of the contemporary atheists, especially those in the new atheist group, This is the passage that they regularly regurgitate as showing how ridiculous religion is. You actually believe that a man was inside of a whale's belly for three days. Here's a quote from Bill Maher. Uh, He's talked about the Jonah story so many times, countless times. He says, if the Bible myth of Jonah and the whale and the mother goose myth of Jack and the Beanstalk were switched at birth so that Jack and the Beanstalk were in the Bible, do you think any child would notice? Uh, how do you respond to these kind of mocking reactions to the story of Jonah? Well, we shouldn't literalize the story of Jonah as though it's a strict historical account. It's it's a um, it's a theologically powerful uh, tale. Uh, the trouble I mentioned this with Peterson actually because he's been on with Bill Maher and they actually talked a bit about Jonah. And I said, you know, Bill Maher was raised as a Catholic, but it's a sign of how poorly instructed he was. And Maher is my generation, so I get it. I mean, we we were all poorly instructed in the Bible, and. Um, what we've been talking about, Brandon, is the whole point of that story. It's not to get hung up on, on the literal truth of it. It's to find this the, these very powerful spiritual lessons in it. So, no, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not distracted by that. All right. So as you hinted, Jonah prays to the Lord asking for deliverance, and then the whale spits him up on the shore. And then God gives Jonah the same mission that he had before, namely to go to Nineveh and preach repentance But this time Jonah obeys, and the people of Nineveh turn to God. They proclaim a fast. They put on sackcloth. In a line that I know you especially appreciate, the scriptures say that even the cattle and the sheep fast in penitence. Uh, What's the takeaway from this final turn of events? Well, it's a comic tale, right? And there's something funny about this because Jonah resisted, went the other way. God brings him back. Uh, Jonah, you know, is reluctant throughout this entire book. We'll get to the very end where he's kind of difficult and reluctant the whole way through. But God makes him the most successful preacher in the history of, of the Bible. And I think, I was just reading this recently, the, the Hebrew 
of the words he he says to to Nineveh, you know, uh, repent or in 40 days you'll be destroyed. It's some little like one line. And in Hebrew, it's like five words. That's all he says. That That's all we get out of him in terms of his prophetic proclamation. But it has this completely, you know, overwhelming effect. It, partially, it's just it's a it's a comic uh, commentary. But it's. No, it's also what happens when you surrender to God's purposes. Watch life increasing 30, 60, and 100 fold. You know, and it watches all in the, in the ministry of Jesus when he's calling people away from their self preoccupation. When you turn your life to me, look at in the stories of the multiplication of loaves and fishes. You know, what do you have? Oh, just this little nothing. Give it to me and you'll find it multiplied. That's the way it works in the spiritual order. So Jonah is like, despite himself, becomes the greatest prophetic preacher in the history of the Bible. Uh, it's what happens when you surrender properly to God. I want to close with this. Notably, Jonah is the only ancient prophet out of dozens and dozens with whom Jesus identifies with in the Gospels. So in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, an evil and unfaithful generation seek a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. At the judgment, the men of Nineveh will arise with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and yet there is something greater than Jonah here. What is Jesus yeah, getting at? It's so powerful. Yeah, we can unpack that over you know a, a week. The only sign will be given is the sign of Jonah. What did Jesus do? He preached, indeed, and healed, yes, indeed. But what was his ultimate purpose? It was to go into the very state of God forsakenness that we sinners find ourselves in not passing judgment from outside, but entering into that condition. So well, Paul, Paul will say, on the cross, Christ becomes sin. See, that's the sign of Jonah, it seems to me. Um, Jonah, in the belly of the fish, is in the state of, of rebellion against God. You know, he's, he's constricted. He's, he's running away from God. That's where Jesus goes. He goes to be with us in that condition. Um, Jonah being spit up on the land, well, then is, is compared to the resurrection. Jesus goes all the way down, and then he comes all the way up, bringing us with him. So it is very powerful that the only sign I'm going to give you, because I'm not here, he's saying, to be uh, like a, an earthly uh, potentate. The, the sign of my ministry is the sign of Jonah. Um, I'm going deep down. I'm going all the way down. Uh, I'm Frodo going to Mordor. I'm going to go all the way in to the darkest country because that's where the Father has sent me, right? Um, and as the people of Nineveh uh, repented at the preaching of Jonah, and he's implying th the world will be called to repent at the preaching and the witness of Jesus, who's, who's the, the Jonah in the full sense, you know? Um, yeah, it's a very powerful remark of the Lord there. Well, if you'd like to go even deeper on the book of Jonah, I encourage you to pick up this book from Word on Fire. Oh, yeah. It's one of the very yeah. first ones we published. It's by Father Paul Murray, and it's titled A Journey with Jonah, A Spirituality of Bewilderment. I think you can get it for just seven bucks. I'll include a link in the show notes. But Father Paul unpacks this strange and beguiling story by drawing on literature, art, and commentators from across the, the Christian and Jewish traditions. This book also includes a very rare 2000. Uh, three Lexio Divina by then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger on the book of Jonah published in English for the first time. So you get reflections from Joseph Ratzinger in addition to Father Paul Murray. So check out this book if you want to go deeper on the book of Jonah. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. Today, we have one from Larry, who lives in Arkansas, and he's asking about Jesus. Here's Larry's question. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Larry Flurry from Bentonville, Arkansas. My question is a two-parter. First, why did Jesus show up when he did roughly 2,000 years ago and not at a different point in time? And secondly, what would the world look like if he didn't show up then? 
or if he showed up later or didn't show up at all. Thank you, and God bless. Yeah, the good questions. Uh, here's a, a quick answer uh, to the first part. He came when the preparation was was done. So think of the Old Testament as an elaborate preparation for the incarnation. So God is preparing this ultimate rescue operation, which is the incarnation, and he prepares for it over many, many centuries, calling um, Abraham and then the whole history of Israel involving covenant and Torah, prophecy, temple, sacrifice, all of that designed to prepare a people to receive his revelation. Um, You might say he came the minute he could, the minute that preparation was complete. Think of the Virgin Mary here, you know, who acquiesces to the angel. She's the embodiment of Israel. She stands for all of Israel's great tradition of longing and waiting. So he came when when they were ready, when the human race was ready to receive him. Um, Could we imagine if the Lord had come when nobody was really ready for him? There was no frame of reference. There was no conceptual system. There was no history to understand him. Well, maybe he it it wouldn't have had an impact. Because even with that long history, a lot of people still didn't get him, right? But you could say he came when it was time, in the fullness of time, you know. What would the world be like if he hadn't come? Well, there was a long period, as I suggest, where the Lord had not come, but but God was preparing the human race. Now, that's up to God. I mean, that that he discerned, all right, this is the moment when, when they're ready. Um, but if the Lord had not come, we wouldn't have found salvation. And um, But he has come. And so that's the word of the church is to declare salvation to the nations. Well, as we wrap up today's show, we have another exciting book launching today. This one is from our uh, imprint of books for young kids. It's called Princesses of Heaven by Fabiola Garza. This is a gorgeous picture book for young girls ages three to eight, written and illustrated by an incredibly talented Disney artist, Fabiola. This book shares the stories of St. Joan of Arc, St. Josephine Bakita, St. Kateri Tekawitha, St. Therese of Lisieux, and others, presenting each of these women as princesses in heaven Mm. with a shining crown. The stories of faith, hope, and love will inspire every girl to become a saint. And I got to say, I'll include a link in the show notes. Click on it and view some of the artwork. This is one of the most visually uh, stunning books I think we've ever published, and, Mm. and I think any young girl will enjoy it. So pick it up. It's called Princesses of Heaven by Fabiola Garza. Finally, uh, as we close this episode, we have a bittersweet announcement to make. Uh, Bishop Barron and I started this podcast over eight years ago. In fact, I remember the exact day. It was September 9th, 2015. And I remember that because it was the day after Bishop Barron was made a bishop. So this podcast is as old as his episcopacy. We've released 427 episodes. So that's over 250 hours of fantastic conversation. I still can't believe we've talked that much over the years and so many people have tuned in. The podcast has over 35 million downloads and views. Now, listen, we're not ending the podcast, so don't worry about that. Uh, The show will go on, but here's the bittersweet news. This will be my final episode as host. Now, I'm not leaving Word on Fire, but I'm stepping back from the podcast so I can focus more exclusively on my role uh, leading Word on Fire's publishing department. Most of you know how excited and, and, uh, and deeply devoted I am to all the books that we release. And we've got some very ambitious projects coming down the pipeline, including 35 new books this year. We're about to release a new academic journal. We've got conferences. We've got the completion of our Word on Fire Bible series and a whole lot more. So I'm stepping back from the Word on Fire show to focus on all of that. However, I am very pleased to announce that our new host for the Word on Fire show will be Matthew Petrusik. I know many of you know him and and already admire him. Matthew is the senior director of the Word on Fire Institute. He's also the professor of Catholic ethics there. Matthew's super bright, engaging, culturally plugged in. He's authored a couple of great books with Word on Fire, including Evangelization and Ideology, and his first book, Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. He specializes in moral philosophy, theology, politics, and the great Catholic intellectual tradition. 
he'll be great. And again, I'm sure you'll love him as the new host. Um, but as I step down, I want to thank all of you, all the listeners and viewers for joining us over these many years. Your friendship, your encouragement, your emails have all been uh, deeply uh, a source of tremendous joy for me, especially those ones telling me how this podcast has led me or a loved one into the church. Nothing could mean more to us than that. And Bishop, I want to thank you for being so committed to this podcast over the years, for sharing so many hundreds of hours of conversation with me. Mm. Uh, as you know, I've enjoyed our discussions immensely, and I just wanted to personally thank you and express my gratitude to you. Oh, well, gosh, Brandon, I mean, it's my gratitude to you. This was your idea, this podcast. I remember when you came to me and said, let's have a podcast kind of following up on things you've you've written. and. And I thought right away, it's a great idea. And I do remember very vividly that first one, the day after I was ordained a bishop. We recorded these in L.A., recorded these in Santa Barbara, now up here in in Rochester. But, I mean, you have been such a marvelous presence. And um, I, I don't think people, they probably don't realize how much work goes into preparing these. You're the one who bears that great burden because you know, come up with the topics, but then a whole series of of questions, observations based upon reading and statistics and things you've found. And I'm always amazed at, at how, how much you accomplish. Uh, and as you suggested, you know, thank God you're not going anywhere. I mean, you're such a pivotal player in Horn on Fire. But it's because <laughs> we ask you to do so many things. And uh, this podcast is a lot. And so I get it that, you know, you want to say, look, I want to focus really on the publishing side. But um I've enjoyed our conversations immensely. And I, I go all over the world. I hear about it. And they they mention you more than me, typically. <laughs> oh, come They on. do. I don't know about that. <laughs> they do. They'll say, I, I love listening to Brandon and you, you know. So I, I, I'm grateful to all, for all you've done. And it's been a marvelous contribution to the church. Matt will be great. Um, I think people will love uh, his uh, interaction. He'll be right here. That'll be a difference because Matt is here in Rochester. So we'll be able to film these kind of the two of us talking in, in person. But, um, you know, I've enjoyed immensely our, our time together and just wish you well as you continue helping Word on Fire and in a thousand ways. Well, thank you, Bishop. And again, thanks to everyone. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. So you might see me popping up here and now on, on Word on Fire videos, but uh, my time of hosting has come to an end and, and Matt will, will capably step into those shoes. Well, for the last time from me, thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thank you.